The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents No Neutrality, where we have a roundtable of contributors pushing the antithesis in every area of life. From family to government, apologetics to homeschooling, being a wife and a mother, a husband, a father, single, widow, business owner or employee, you will hear commentary, essays, lectures, blogs, and battle plans on how to bring forth the Christian worldview to all of life. Two, one, go ahead. Well, I'm going to talk today about justice and forgiveness. On the way up from Georgetown, I see the billboard, Real Christians Forgive Like Jesus. Now, we better straighten that out before we get too much past the billboard, because they're saying something specific when they say that. They already have a notion in mind that all forgiveness is unconditional and untied and untethered and unlinked to anything related to justice, to the atonement, to Christ himself and his work and what he came to do. So it's important that we straighten that stuff out, and hopefully by the end of our discussion we'll have a better grasp on that, and we can then agree with that statement taken in its proper sense. Because when Jesus said those amazing words, as he's being crucified, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. It's important to realize that's when the hammer blows are falling. That's when the soldiers are cursing. And he says this. But if he says this to say, without my my atonement, without my crucifixion, without this work of God, it's okay. Uh, Just uh, wipe it off their slate. Because, because it's meaningless, that's not what's at stake at all. When Dr. Rush Juni, in his book, Cure of Souls, and it's not the only time he mentions it, but I mention this book because I think it's significant, because it talks about this issue a lot, false doctrines of forgiveness, the damage it does to Christendom as a result of being propagated and weakening us and eroding our faith and eroding our notion of justice, and therefore detracting from the cross and the work of Christ, minimizing it in the interest of moralism, trivializing the faith, that's a dangerous thing. So when he talks about this passage, he says this. He says, what happened in Luke, Jesus said these words, was something very different than what most people understand. He was calling for a suspension of immediate execution of justice. Why would not God instantly slam these guys with lightning for driving nails through his son's hands? It's a suspension. And as Rushdie points out this allows history to happen because without that suspension of judgment, there'd be no history. We would not be here, except that that judgment has been set aside so that God's work on the cross and its implications would flow out the cross time to us and to many passages about. Now, Rushdie did not come up with this out of his head, just because it was a convenient way to push justice back in our face. He got it from Klaus Schilder, the Dutch scholar who went through all the passages as he's discussing the crucifixion of Christ and saying, if Jesus meant what most people think, then everything else he said on this topic is meaningless, and he contradicts himself. Because he's very clear, what will the owner of the vineyard do when he comes and sees what happened to his son? He'll utterly destroy these people and bear bear its fruit in its season. See? So what is happening here is actually a suspension of justice. The, the, The sentence is going to be delayed. And it's been pointed out in Ecclesiastes 8.11, when you uh, sustain or postpone a sentence, something very interesting happens. Not necessarily a good thing. There in that passage in Ecclesiastes, the writer says, because uh, a sentence is not executed speedily against an evil work, the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. In other words, people compound uh, their sin. They believe that they are now in a much better place because nothing happened. The bolt didn't fall. I therefore have been given space to repent, but I'm going to abuse the time that God gave me. So God there has to come down and change and shake each and every one of us because we cannot misinterpret God's graciousness toward us. When God gives us that space to repent, like he gave Jezebel in Revelation 2, that was for a purpose, to repent. And she didn't take the time to repent of her evil acts. And so justice has to be foundational. When we start talking about justice, we start at something as important as the fact that that word justice is repeated twice in Deuteronomy 16.20. 
Justice, justice shalt thou do. That is not optional. That's what the Messiah came to do. That's what the Messiah came to get us to do, to be ministers of reconciliation. And that's on God's terms of right and wrong. If God doesn't dispense with it, God builds it into us through the Holy Spirit. He writes his law through the new covenant into the hearts and minds of his people so that it obtains spontaneous obedience. And one of the implications is justice being foremost and front and center. We even read this from the famous passage, we all know it from Isaiah 2. Many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. What happens? The law of the Lord goes forth, and then what? Nation shall not lift up sword against nation anymore. First you have to have everyone coming to God's law, and then that peace comes. Peace is not a direct result of anything. It's a consequence, a byproduct of justice flowing, of justice being realized in our world. Jesus came so that the law would be kept. That's laid out there in Matthew 5.18. For I say, verily, verily, amen, amen, I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle shall pass from the law until all of them, the jots and tittles, are accomplished, until they be accomplished. So we're not yet there, are we, folks? The law of God has not been accomplished. We are not walking in it. In fact, it's being broken a billion times every minute right now. I hate to say amen to that because I don't really like it. But God's doing something about it because he is transforming the world and he's taking a world that was totally given over to sin and destruction and going to prepare it to give it back to the Father so that he is all in all. So we have two until clauses in that phrase. Until all the law is kept, until heaven and earth pass away, it is still binding. Therefore, justice is still upon us as an obligation. In Psalm 119, verse 126, a very worrisome verse. It is time for thee, O Lord, to work, for they've made void thy law. What gets God off of the, the, uh, the carpet, if you will, to act? We make void his law. How many times do we make void his law? Well, we can do it several ways. We can say, it's not applying anymore. That's one way to void the law real fast. It doesn't apply. We know how the Pharisees did it. It is Corban. We don't have to deal with our parents. We can give the thing as a gift and undercut the family this way. And God hated that. We will make void the law of God, teaching instead the commandments of men. And so God goes to work on us. And that's not a positive thing, except that it's corrective, but it's not something to look forward to. Our mission is to say, say this with God, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How is God's will done in heaven? Perfectly, by the angels. It says so in Psalm 103. Calvin drew attention to it. There, the angels do, or flaming messengers that do God's will continually. There's perfect order there. That's what we ought to be praying for and working for. That's the mission that we have here. In fact, he says the whole point of the Lord's Prayer is that we pray to this end that all rebellion against God be extinguished and that his law is voluntarily kept by all. Now, that's the end game. We're not yet at the end game. We're at the foundational stage where we're building the foundations, the first stones. We're actually we're getting the spoon to dig the excavation of the kingdom of God, which is rooted in justice, in his justice. And we read this in Psalm, and rather Isaiah 9. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. In other words, he continues to grow without limit upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice. There it is, from henceforth even forever. What is the throne of God? Well, we read it in the Psalms and elsewhere. The foundation of his throne is justice and judgment. And here, when the Messiah is growing his kingdom as he's doing right now, he's doing what? He establishes it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, from this point, forward. And there will be no end to the increase of it. So you want to be on the winning side? You're on the side of justice. Hence, when God proclaims that great oath of his, uh, I've sworn by myself, words that have gone out of my mouth, shall not return void, that all of the world shall be saved. In other words, it says that, be saved all the ends of the world. And this command that the world be saved in Isaiah 45, 22, and 23 has an oath of tie to it. And it's been noticed by a lot of folks saying, hey, this is not something that's casual or inconsequential. When God swears his own life on something, that's to be taken seriously. There's, God swears an oath that the world will be saved. And therefore, pessimism about this goal does not make sense. Here's the other point. How is the law going to be kept? 
The law can only be kept by Christians. Why? Because the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart and mind and soul. And God will not accept feigned faith and love. It means nothing to him. And he is as, as empty as when the demon says, you're the, the Messiah. And, and Jesus says, I want to hear it from you. I want to hear it from you. You've got an impure hearts, and therefore it's a corrupt communication. There's the other point. When you have justice, they shall not hurt nor destroy all my holy mountains. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Notice that. They shall not hurt. There shall not be pain. There shall not be suffering. There shall not be abuse. And we're going to get to this topic of abuse very shortly because our world is awash hmm. in terrible abuses. Abuses that are excused from pulpits. <clears throat> Sexual abuses. Power abuses. Forms of tyranny that we would not imagine but be possible in the house of God. And yet there it is. And it's excused on the basis of the house of God. God needs to teach us, and he does teach us these things. Because the new covenant is all about, and they shall no longer need to teach this neighbor, saying, Know the Lord, but they shall all know him from the least to the greatest. And what's an important part of that knowledge? That God has written his law in the hearts and the minds of his people. Mm. And again, that means spontaneous obedience. It's a different thing than it's talked about in Romans, when he says, well, the pagans or the Romans, the Gentiles, they uh, have the law of God. Well, it doesn't actually say that, does it? It says they have the work of the law written in the hearts. In other words, they have a conscience. They know that something's right or wrong, and that conscience can excuse or accuse, depending if it's seared or not. But that's a very different thing than when the law of God itself is written by the Holy Spirit, finger of God in the heart, and that, therefore, changes the man. Changes the man. And therefore, we have permanent cessation of war. There should be no more war, because peace increases without end. That's why we rejoice when the Messiah comes in on the famous day, Sao Palm Sunday, Zechariah 9. We're told he is just in having salvation. How important. What's put forward in front of salvation, that he's our Savior? He is just. That comes first. Before the salvation. We should rejoice in his justice being more foundational. That the salvation is part of that package, but it doesn't subvert it. it certainly wouldn't subvert something if it's secondary or subordinate. To his justice. Justice is that foundation. As a result, he cuts off the battle bow and the chariot and the horse in Jerusalem. His mm. dominion shall be from sea to sea, from the, in, in the river to the ends of the earth. Mm. It's profound. But that comes from what, what? What's the first thing he has? He is just, then having salvation, lowly, riding on the ass upon the colt, the bull of an ass. And even though he's got this lowly little animal he's riding on, he's going to cut off the battle bow and the horses, chariots, and all the mm. weapons of war. When we get to what uh, Moses has to say about the Messiah and the God of our, our, our fathers. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. And therefore, defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy. This is not optional. This was not some Old Testament thing. By the way, <clears throat> just talking, talking about uh, forgiveness. In King James Bible, that term is used 95 times. Uh, 40, uh, was it, uh, let me get the number here. Yeah, that's it. 48 times in the Old Testament, 47 times in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness appears more often in the Old Testament. It's not as if so, suddenly God says, I'm in a forgiving mode in the New. No, mm -hmm. it was balanced across both Testaments. Mm -hmm. Right? It is a whole counsel of God. And by the way, when I wrote my article, uh, Liberty from Abuse, one of the first things I pushed forward was this. How is it that you are to be guiltless of the blood of any man? You do not fail. You do not shun to proclaim unto them the whole counsel of God. That's what Paul says. The whole counsel of God. Which means we are jot and tiddlers. It means we have to take the whole word of God. All 613 commandments. We can set aside worry about the ones that might be ceremonial at another time. That's not the issue. The issue is it's a package deal. And if you take one scripture and try to promote it at the expense of the rest, then you are being pharisaical. You are old minded. You have to be very careful about scripture. We must proclaim the whole counsel of God. It can be very easy for Jesus to battle with the Pharisee and show where the mistake is, or Shadrachie and his errors about the resurrection. But we must be mindful of doing the same thing. We must observe to proclaim the whole counsel of God. Most errors occur because a piece of the Word of God has been left on the table, has been thrown under the bus. We don't have the benefit of having it in front of us to deal with it. And that's a disaster to us. The 
move a little bit quicker here because our, our time is running very fast. Which is, it must be Waco time. <laughs> I'll talk to you boys about that after the talk. In Isaiah 42, it is one of the key passages about the Messiah, and it's important because it's quoted in Matthew 12. We read this, Hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation, for a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my justice to rest for a light of the people. My righteousness is near, my salvation is gone forth, and mine arm shall judge the people. The isle shall wait upon me, and on mine arm shall they trust. That's Isaiah 51, verse 4 and 5. And it's the same idea as the isle shall wait for his law on Isaiah 42. But notice that I will make my justice to rest for a light, for a light of the people. My righteousness is near, and my salvation is forth. What's put forward first? My justice is the light. And then in that light, everything can be seen properly. We are not walking in the darkness when we work in terms of God's light. Even when we deal with the issue of who do you well, vote for in election, November's, we have these big dis disputes, like you're voting for that guy, you're voting for that guy, how could you possibly do there's one litmus test if you're going to apply any. It's not a pragmatic one. It's one laid out by King David in his final words. Second Samuel. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me, He that ruleth over man must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Mm -hmm. Those are the two criteria. He's just, and how do you measure justice? Against the whole counsel of God. He rules in the fear of God because he doesn't fear man. He's not a man fear. He doesn't respect persons. He's not going to take bribes. So we get consistency in this man. So he is just. He walks according to the law of God. If you are putting into office people who are unjust, do not fear God, but are going to fear man, then you have just created your own hell. And we're very adept at doing exactly that. Isaiah 56. Keep your judgment and do justice. For my salvation is near to come. What's first again? Justice, judgment, then the salvation part. See, you get the cart before the horse, salvation, salvation, salvation. That's not going to get you very far, because if you leave justice in the lurch, the foundations are gone. And then Psalm 11.3 comes to mind. What will the righteous do if the foundations are destroyed? Mm. The foundations God's throne is destroyed, you're in a world of hurt. Mm. Luther changed all of history with this one point, the just shall live by his faith. The just, those who are just, those who walk according to justice shall live by their faith. It's a profound thing. Now I'm going to move on a little bit quicker here. It's not quite the, about the one-third mark, so this is good timing. There's a whole lot about general equity. We have this law, I'm going to apply it through general equity. What do we, does that mean? That means, well, there's a little secrets in here. We have to mine and lean from the Word of God to pull out something that's useful for us for today. It's not really that hard. And the good news is the Word of God is potent. It is just rich and fertile with stuff that we haven't yet touched because we're shallow. We should admit it off the bat. Because at least if you admit you're shallow, you can do something about it. If you think we're cruising pretty, mm. you're <laughs> you're self-deceived. Right? Then you need to read Bonson's dissertation on self-deception. It's, it's a big work on exactly that point. But I have seen an end of all perfection, but... Thy commandment is exceeding broad. That's right out of Psalm 119, verse 96b. That's important. Thy commandment is exceeding broad. It means it applies to everything. And we can apply it to questions about forgiveness. Even. So what we want to talk about is when we talk about general equity and the growth of justice, we means we go from justice over time to justice to justice. And we're not shirking the grace or the forgiveness. It's all coming along with that package if it's done right with the whole counsel of God. If it's done in the... Uh, parceled out way, partitioning things in a dispensational way, say, cutting it up, and severing the word of God and slicing its carotid artery, that's a problem. But you don't have to go there. You can keep it all together. So when you develop what I call the gospel of justice, the good news that God's justice is part and parcel with his forgiveness, the good news of Christ and the atonement and setting us right with him, and changing the world as a result, we say that that growth has to become more extensive and intense. It has to become wider in its reach to more things that we haven't touched yet with God's justice properly, or things we've papered over and we need to now go through the painful process of saying, we erred here, we made a big mistake here, we uh, wrought horrible evils here, either passively or actively, or uh, generations before have, and we need to at least acknowledge that so we don't follow the same path and make every correction necessary extensive. See what I'm saying? The Word of God is to penetrate all these areas where perhaps we've been shut off.
shut we shut our mouths at it. Right? There's a time when you shut your mouth, but that's when the king shut their mouths at the king of kings. Mm -hmm. Out of Isaiah 52, right? The king shall shut their mouths at him, because he speaks and we shut up. But if he's speaking, we better listen and do. Right? Also, the law of God has to be more intensive, it has to be deeper. We have to plumb underneath to the mineral rights. Right? <laughs> not just you know, the alluvial rights, as they say, we need to know very not just about the surface things, but what's underneath the surface. Because first, sin hides deep, deep down in our hearts. That's where the, actually the, the sin nature is. It's the propensity to want to put our own will in front of God's will. Mm -hmm. And so we can talk a big talk, and a lot of reconstructionists can do this because we're trained at it, as, as myself included. That doesn't mean that deep down in the deepest part of my heart, everything is well and good. It may well be that it's, it's a pitiful pit full of dead men's bones and all men's construction. And now, of course, I look like a, a blackened sepulcher, not a whitened one, but you get the idea. <laughs> That's, you know, the problem is the same thing, because we have to be intensive. We have to dig deeper. So extension, intensive, both aspects. Mm -hmm. And when you fail to go in these paths, then we have crises erupt out of Christendom, and they show how weak we are. And in one case, they show how weak reformed conservative Christians are compared to their liberal progressive counterparts. And that's the abuse crisis. Who is light years ahead of us in trying to deal with church abuse and sexual abuse and clergy abuse? It's the progressives. It's the, the Presbyterians and the Methodists and the Congregationalists who are the Universalists who we would say their, their gospel is shot. It's terrible. They, they, they threw the law of God under the bus. They have no doctrine of inerrancy. It's all basically baptized humanism, and all that is true. But you know something? They're way ahead of us where it counts, which is sad, hmm. because the light should have come from our corner. We were given that opportunity. We had more given to us, so God requires more of the Reformed Christian who has, and talks about the whole counsel of God. And we talk, but talk's not as cheap, right? So we're kind of behind in this whole area. I went with my, my wife and, and with Jerry Ward and the Shepherds to a conference last October in Austin. And we were probably the only uh, Reformed Christians or conservative Christians. Everyone else that was extremely liberal in their Christianity, we would not recognize them uh, and say, you know, because they would have uh, uh, female pastors and things like this, and we'd all have heart attacks over that. But what they were doing was correct. What they were doing was dealing with the problem that we refused to deal with in our churches. So their churches are getting cleaned out. Their churches don't have this issue because they're dealing with it properly. And they did it without a full knowledge of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Right? Their own conscience told them this couldn't stand. Whereas we actually have scriptures that tell us how to deal with it, and we don't exegete those. We don't deal with them. One of the passages I'm going to talk about is this uh, big one in uh, Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34 is one of three passages in scripture where bad shepherds are talked about. Shepherds that are doing evil things. Uh, and the other passages are Jeremiah 23 and Zechariah 11. So this passage in uh, Ezekiel 34, 10, that 10th verse actually gives a sanction, a biblical sanction. And the sanction is so important, I'm going to repeat this again, so important to God that he swears his life on it. It's one of those, what's called a self-maledictory oath, where he says, may I be set aside as a dead idol if I don't enforce this, if I don't watch you enforce this. So God curses himself over this action. Is that serious? He says, these shepherds that abuse the flock, they shall no more feed themselves on my flock ever. They will not make another penny. Now, that does not mean these men may not be forgiven, but that office is gone, right? Ex officio, they are cashiered permanently. That's the scriptural sanction. And how many churches in Christendom the evangelical side, Protestant side, actually enforces. Oh no, we have whole ministries about how to restore pastors after they have mm. ruined their flocks. Mm. Get them back quickly. Mm. You know, everyone remembers the story of uh, Swaggart. They told him, well, you're going to have to be out for so many years. And he says, no, it's gonna, I'm going to just determine how long I'm out, and then I'm coming back. Right? So there's no repentance anywhere. No, but the point is that Scripture doesn't even allow him back in the pulpit. Mm. He has forfeited his right because he's deliberately harmed the flock. So when we have sexual abuses perpetrated by the clergy, and they're back in the pulpit because we're forgiving people, God hates this. God, so what is the part about my swearing an oath against my own life did you not catch? Hmm. You're not reading Ezekiel 34? Hmm. Who told you that it was optional? God doesn't give his oaths. You know, there's a thing. Uh, when an oath is made, is for, for confirmation. 
you. So there's no dispute. How can it be disputed when God says, I make, I make an oath so there's no dispute, and we dispute God's oath? Because hmm. we want to be a nice guy with the pastor. But, well, you can be his buddy, I suppose, if he's repentant, but not if he's in the pulpit. You have to cry that that wolf has to come out. Mm -hmm. You can be a repentant wolf, and you can be in the flock. And I probably will watch him to make sure he's really honestly... It can be certainly, certainly true repentance, but his options are restricted. He is to be blocked. That's the one fencing that God's oath requires. They are fenced from the pulpit when they have abused the flock in such a way described in this passage. And to place them out. Someone likes what I'm saying? I hate what I'm yep. saying, but I have to say it. Okay? Ezekiel. So, now read that passage just so you see it. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock, neither shall the shepherds flee, feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, they may not be meat for them. In other words, they will not feed themselves. Jeremiah says it this way, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. They shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, says the Lord. You know, right now we have a lot of flocks that are dismayed and shocked and in fear of what's going on from their own pulpits. Yeah. We talk, we talk about this title, Reconstruction. We're building things brand new. Okay, that's great. Let me start the pulpit. <laughs> right? And if you've got crummy pulpits, start a new pulpit. By God, start a new one. You know? Warfield says sometimes you can't split the rotten wood. There's no point in it. You have to start. And when he said that to Machen, he meant that sometimes spiritual life will arise from someplace other than the institutional church. Yes. But if you're laboring in the institutional church, then labor with all your might because perhaps it could be recovered for God. All these institutional churches had such strong roots at the beginning. Maybe you can call them back to their roots instead of them drifting away into R2K and all sorts of things, which they do. There's something about this centrifugal pull away from the orthodoxy, and we have to fight it. So that's critical to us. Here's the other problem, is that when you have judicial matters, when we talk about the forgiveness of the pastor, we already have established that that is in, in, in erroneous and is blocked for that case, where forgiveness and justice do not meet except in terms of removal from office. Then talk about his restoration possibly in the flock, if he's not in fact still a predator. Is this, we hear this, where are those two or three witnesses? Over and over again, we hear this, where are those two or three witnesses? And let me tell you, that is an interesting rule, and we have a major case in scripture where it's overturned. Mm -hmm. If you know it, if you heard this before, you're gonna hear it again, I'm sorry. You can tune into yeah. the Waco radio station if you want to uh, make good on your time. But it's this. It's in 1 Kings 3, 16 to 28. These two prostitutes, they come and appeal a case. They, they say, hey, that's my baby. No, it's my baby. You Swiss babies on me. No, this is yours. That was the dead one's yours. And so these two people who are on the edge of society, God still says, you have a claim to justice from me. But where are they going to get it? Because everywhere they go, people say, no, there's no two witnesses. Sorry. Sorry. We can't proceed. Can't go away with this case. Guess who took the case? Solomon. The king took the case. Exactly. Why did the king take the case? Because in Proverbs we read, right, that it's the glory of the king to search out a matter. Yes. He had the power to figure it out. He was able to set in motion the things that would reveal the truth that was otherwise cloaked over and hidden. And he's able to get to the truth of the matter, whose baby it was, right? But we lack Solomonic faith today, don't we? Mm. But James says, if you pray for wisdom, you'll get it. We're not even praying for that kind of wisdom. We kind of figure, well, if we put it to the secular judge, that's a catastrophe. You have to do what Psalm 1 says, meditate upon God's law day and night to get that kind of wisdom. Mm. Solomon got it, and he still lost track of it down the line, didn't he? Mm. You could have it and lose it, because he didn't apply it. Our delight has to be in the law of God all the way across the board. Mm. Jesus said something very profound. He says, a greater than Solomon is here. That means we, walking in the spirit of Christ, should say, that means we can use the Jesus model. He was able to figure out some interesting things about that woman at the well. So perhaps God can reveal things to us. The example that Rush Tooney gives, let me check my time again. It's almost over, believe it or not, which is not good. <laughs> but it is... Uh, good for Colin because he gets to start. And it's good for getting hot tacos. <laughs> yeah, this wisdom, it's Ecclesiastes 9, 18 says, wisdom is better, better than weapons of war. 
better. Mm. Okay. So, but right now, what do Christians tend to use? Weapons of war mm. against each other. So, let's go for the wisdom approach. Because, you know, like I say, kindergartners cannot solve a calculus problem. And what this was, was a calculus problem that was put in front of King Solomon. There was another king recent, more recently than him, uh, who operated in the terms of this, by, by me kings reign, princes decree justice, Proverbs 18. Kings reign by God's wisdom and justice, and they princes decree justice, there it is again, and to do justice and judgment more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. And that guy, oh, one more thing. In truth shall he bring forth justice. This is a uh, from the quotation from the Hebrew, direct Hebrew of uh, Isaiah 2. And when Hank Stenberg says this, why is it that truth is the way that justice is brought forth? He says, because every other mode of dealing with justice would be established only in appearance and outwardly. In other words, if we're not doing justice with truth, it is superficial. It's shallow. It's killing us. See it? So, that's the key. So, who's this other king? Richard III. You have a good impression of Richard III? And almost certainly you don't. You know why? Because humanists have essentially um, bagged this guy as one of the worst kings of all time, Richard III, and condemned him. But Rushton, he says, this was the real deal. He was able to take appellate cases that were tough, that could not be handled, and he was able to resolve them the way Solomon did. And we don't hear about this. He said, because people, because there's a guy doing what God requires, and therefore, people are just trying to expunge his record, so we are not aware of the relationship of justice to forgiveness, among other things. Okay, it's so now that we're at the uh, end of that point, I'm going to say one more thing. Justice and forgiveness. The forgiveness thing is very important because when we talk about, say, the case of the excommunication that occurred in 1 Corinthians 5, about the case of incest. We had a very clear piece of law applying, right? What was that piece of law? That piece of law was out of Leviticus 18.8. says, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father. She, he was not el eligible to have that person as his wife. So what happens back then in when we revisit this excommunication in the second chapter, the second book of Corinthians? Now, pull that up for us, just so we see where forgiveness and justice meet hand in hand. We first read, Sufficient to such a man, whatever it is, verse 1, But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me. But that I might not overcharge you all, but he grieved you all in part. But this is the point. Let me just turn this thing off because it's making a racket. Sorry about that. In part. That means that each person in Corinth had a different attitude about that person. Some thought it was a very grievous thing. Some saw it as middling, fair to middling, and other people didn't care. So each one in a different portion of proportion was upset by it. Some of them said, because they're simply upset with Paul. They had a personal motive for trying to uh, detract from Paul's attempt to uh, work with discipline. But then Paul says, sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. Now, the King James is wrong there. That word is by the majority. It turned out that it was not a complete excommunication. It was done by at least the majority. More did than did not participate in it. But it was sufficient, even at a partial, because it had an effect. Sorrow. Sorrow that was so severe, in the case of this man, that it was to consume him. And that word to consume is for animals devouring something. This stuff of sorrow is actually personified something that would chew this guy up, even though he had repented. So that's an important point. To comfort him, lest he be such a one be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. So against confirmation of love... Continuing on, to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. In other words, the whole point of the excommunication exercise, by and large, was to see whether you would obey the counsel of God laid out by Paul. To him ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, which actually the presence of Christ, that's the actual correct rendering. He says, I actually forgave it ahead of you guys forgiving him. I forgave that man. Which is an interesting thing. Because he says, lest Satan should get an advantage or overpower us. Satan will overpower us because we're not ignorant of his devices, mm. his thoughts, his, what he's going to put into effect. What is that Satan's going to use the division that this occasion has generated as a cause to use it? We don't want to have Satan get any attack on us, any advantage to overpower us in our handling of a thing like this. 
So it's very, very important to see that there's a goal here, that everything has to have an end game. And here the, the, the blessing of the forgiveness that arose was key. When you look at passages, the uh, seventh chapter, 12th verse of Second Corinthians, he says, I did not do it because of the man who did the sin or the guy who did the offended, which was his father, but I did it for your sakes. It was for the church. So the church would therefore be able to get together and agree and be united in their proper sense of justice and forgiveness together, united. So this is an important point, that we don't want to have Satan gain an advantage over us if we are not approaching these things properly. So there's a proper place for forgiveness, and there's a proper place for dealing with all these complexities, but they have to be then shaped by Scripture. We have to be acknowledgement that this, this historic case was a very tough one that was being dealt with. And it wasn't the first time the church was going to confront problems in its midst that dealt with questions of moral uh, uh, behavior in this case, the violation of an incest law, relations to doctrine, which is more obvious in the case in, uh, of the Thyatiran church in Revelation 2.20. We have doctrine being uh, propagated as dangerous and bad. That has to be dealt with too. But how is it dealt with? We have to go examine all these things. So when we deal with these things, we must realize that we are limited to the word of God, which is fine because the law of God is all we need. If we don't believe in the sufficiency of the law of God, that means that we have to add to it. The second we do that, there's a curse, isn't there? I mean, we have no choice. If there's nothing inadequate, so if there's a problem, it's a problem that is in our application of it as opposed to God's use of it. So all that to say, there are a lot of hot topic things out there that we want to deal with properly and in good order until we get the answers right because a lot of people are looking at us. And if you say, where are reconstructionists? They say, well, how do reconstructionists handle abuse? How do reconstructionists handle something in their midst that they don't like? Are they going to follow God's law, or are they going to do it differently? So we're all on the hook. Every single person here is on the hook in some way. And so therefore, we have to go back to the meditating upon every jot and tittle of God's law and making sure every part of it applies properly. And then we can go forward. I talked a little bit about maybe we have some doctrinal issues that require the church to have an international church council. The you know, last time that council was called, all 2,000 members of the Evangelical Theological Society were invited directly, personal letters sent to each one. Guess how many agreed to show up? Two. 0.1% response, because everything's cruising along just fine, thank you very much. And so with this attitude, it's no small wonder we're not going to get anywhere, is it? If you have problems that need to be dealt with church-wide, then we need to think big. We need not to, to say we have, we have a big God. We have a God that has gathered people in the past to solve these problems in the second, third, fourth, fifth centuries. They gathered from far around to solve them, and get them, get things straight, and block error after that point. And therefore, justice and forgiveness can be gated according to the received knowledge of the church at large. In the meantime, we have to work pretty hard and, and, and peddling for all of our might to get there. So. Our doctrine of forgiveness has to be a biblical one and has to be premised on the atonement of God. And it is not wild and untethered from Scripture. Like I said, this pastor who uh, did something evil, we have every right to pull him out of office permanently. But he can be forgiven if the fruits of repentance are there. But he does not go back into office. You understand? Yes. Forgiveness has scriptural limits because God will not tolerate someone shepherding in his name because he's the ultimate capital S shepherd who does that. You get one strike and you're out. That's how it works with God's justice from the pulpit. Yeah. It's that simple. Thank you for listening. Sorry it was such a grim topic, but I'm going to have something even grimmer, public schools. <laughs> uh, real quick. Real quick, uh, so we have time for our, this is for our live audience and also for anybody in the room. Does anybody have any quick questions, real quick, for uh, uh, for Dr. Celebrator? Yeah, I'm not a doctor, by the way. So. Just out of love. Honorary doctorate in the house. Well, the doctor it, doesn't, it doesn't matter anything if we give it out, so don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Well, can I say that right. <laughs> Anybody have any questions, though? Questions for, questions for Martin? Well, Mark will be here, so All right. you come up, catch him with some tacos in your hand. All right, show him some love, y'all. That was that was a. Uh... All right, I, I don't like speaking after Martin. Prepare to fall off the intellectual precipice into my.
Thank you for listening to this episode of No Neutrality on the Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network. Don't forget to visit reconstructionistradio.com to download your favorite audiobooks and podcasts. And if you are a Christian Reconstructionist blogger and you'd like to contribute your blogs into this audio blog format, click on the volunteer link on our website, send us an email, and let us know you'd like to join the team. May Christ be glorified and His kingdom extended from sea to sea and from the rivers to the ends of the earth. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.